Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Will Dupree at KXAN in Austin. We're going to listen in now to a news conference that's happening here in the capital city from the Public Utility Commission of Texas and ERCOT. The CEO and interim president of ERCOT and the chairman of the PUC board is going to be talking about uh, preparations for the summer months and how the electric grid can handle that. Let's take a listen in as this begins. Stabilizing the grid for the summer, redesigning the market for the future, and setting expectations for the remainder of the summer. Texans demand and deserve a reliable grid, and that's our top priority. The governor and the legislature have spoken. They substantially reformed ERCOT governance, they mandated weatherization, and they required a redesign of our market to enhance reliability, among many other initiatives. In addition, Governor Abbott sent us a letter with additional guidance regarding reinforcing reliability of the grid this summer and offering strong guidance on market redesign. The Public Utility Commission is taking robust action to implement this legislation. We have 30 rulemaking projects underway at the moment, which is an unprecedented effort in the recent history of this agency. First, let's talk about stabilizing the grid for the summer. Out of the gates, we fixed several problems that have plagued us in the past related to extraordinary costs during emergencies and uncertainty around pricing rules during emergencies. More importantly, going forward, the PUC has directed ERCOT to first improve the margin of safety on the grid. We need a cushion of extra reserves going into the deep deepest, hottest part of the summer. And second, we've directed ERCOT to operate with an abundance of caution. We have no room for error, and we've asked ERCOT to manage the grid accordingly. Brad can share how he's implementing those policy directives. Thank you, Chairman. So when I was asked to serve as the interim CEO at ERCOT, the first thing I did is to commit to both the governor and to the chair of the PUC, that I would work to develop a plan that changes how ERCOT operates and improves the reliability of the grid. Through legislation that was passed through this last session and through the direction of the governor and the policy direction of the PUC, we have developed a plan we call the Roadmap to Improving Grid Reliability. That roadmap is significant. It is deep. I hope that you take a, a close look at the roadmap because there are a number of items on it that I think you will be interested in. Let me walk you through a few of the things that we have been focused on in developing that roadmap and completing the roadmap. Number one, as the chairman has said, we are operating in a more reliable manner than we have ever done before. We are bringing more generation across peak to be able to meet the needs of all Texans and to keep our grid reliable. We are buying more ancillary services that we have in the past. And we're also releasing those ancillary services quicker to the market. And when necessary, we'll call upon conservation. Because conservation is a tool that we intend to use. It's used across the country. It is used across the world. And it's a tool that helps us to keep our grid reliable. I want you to know that we will continue to provide you updates on that plan. Currently, we have completed 22 out of the 60 initiatives. We intend to show to you each month, at the beginning of every month, where we are on those initiatives and provide you evidence of how we've completed each of those items. So we intend to stay in close communication with you as we deliver the elements of that plan. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Brad. And I will also highlight when you uh, say that you're bringing on more reserves and forcing more generation on uh, in tight situations, I'd like to put some numbers to that. In bringing on more reserves, ERCOT in July has called more 38 percent more reserves than this year than last year. In August, they've already called or procured 56 percent more reserves for this August than they did last August. In terms of uh, forcing generators on and when conditions demand it, 
In June, ERCOT called on over eight times as much generation to be forced on than in previous years. And in July, they called on over 32 times as much generation than they have previously. That is a substantial enhancement on the reserve capacity and ability of our grid and a strong enhancement to our reliability. Also want to highlight that those operational changes are happening now and they will enhance reliability for Texas this summer. Looking ahead, we have been tasked with redesigning the ERCOT market for the future. Historically, our market has focused on affordability first, reliability second, but now reliability is first. Several decades ago, our market was designed before intermittent renewables were so prevalent. They're a beneficial part of our generation fleet, but they have outpaced our market design, and we must take that new reality into account when we design our new market for the future. In redesigning the ERCOT market, we're working off of two guiding principles. First, reliability, and second, accountability. We want our market to pay for reliable electricity in any form, thermal dispatchable, renewable with battery, fuel storage on site, et cetera. There is a myriad of possibilities, but the emphasis is on providing economic incentives for reliable electricity. Second, accountability. Our market needs to provide economic incentives for generators who commit to showing up at a certain time and actually show up. Our focus will be on reliability and accountability. What does this look like in practice? We don't know yet. There are a myriad of possibilities uh, in changing how generators are paid for producing electricity in Texas to adding new financial products that reward reliability uh, to allocating costs differently. And because there is such a wide range of possibilities, that's why we're working with so many stakeholders across the industry across our consumer interest groups to make sure that we hear all voices uh, and take into account a wide range of perspectives in redesigning this market. Finally, I'd like to discuss the expectations for the remainder of the summer. We are embarking on once-in-a-generation reforms, and that takes time. But the weather won't wait, so we need to be ready. We have more people in Texas than ever. That means higher demand for electricity than ever. We're expecting to set new records in coming weeks. Brad, can you speak to the expectations as we move into August? Good, thank you. Just next week, we expect to have extremely high heat in the area as well as a high load expectation. Our load expectation could reach all-time highs for ERCOT. We're projecting somewhere around 74,000 megawatt hours. The current record is 74,820. So we're getting very close to our all-time record. As it stands today, looking at our conditions and what we expect to have next week, we expect to have a sufficient amount of generation to serve all Texans. Thank you, Brad. It's going to be tight for the rest of the summer. We all know the heat is coming, uh, but we're ready for it. In the meantime, we'll be redesigning the ERCOT market for the future so that Texas has a grid that reliably delivers affordable power. Overall, we're in a good position. We have clear direction and a strong mandate from the legislature and the governor. We have the tools we need to do the job, and we've got the support of stakeholders and industry participants across the board. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions at this time. Chairman, can we discuss real quick? So, uh, as we discuss, we'll go. We'll start here with questions in the room, uh, and then we'll go to our uh, media joining us by phone. So, uh, Don, if you want to get those folks queued up, give them any quick instructions you need to, uh, and then we'll we'll start here in the room. Certainly, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press one then zero on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Again, it'll be one then zero. Thank you, Don. So, Rudy, we'll start with you and then just work our way across the room if that's okay. Chairman, you, you said that you're not quite sure how this new animal is going to look like, uh, but what is your vision for this new animal? In terms of the market redesign, yes, sir. Uh, 
I guess for the average, you know, the consumer, you know, we, we just heard this, and, and honestly, my eyes kind of glazed over a little bit. And so I can imagine <laughs> that the person home, at home was maybe going, huh? Are the lights going to stay on, and is my bill going up? I think those are the two big questions that people at home want to know. The lights are going to stay on, and your bill should not change. Our goal is to reallocate the payments that are currently being made to the most reliable source of power. We don't want to raise costs, and we don't expect that we will raise costs. We're just shifting the payments to the, to the generators that provide the most reliable electricity in the most accountable manner possible. And as a follow-up director, you mentioned that we are entering August. Uh, it's going to be bad. It's going to be hot. But you're, you're making a commitment right now. We're not going to get these alerts saying conserve your power, or could that still happen? So as I said, we believe next week looks good. Uh, based on all of our expectations, all of our forecasts, we believe we have plenty of generation to meet the needs of Texans. But going back to conservation, I believe that conservation is a tool that we need to keep in our toolbox. Conservation is a tool that allows us to, to, to talk to every, day, to every Texan and have Texans help each other to keep the grid reliable. So when we need conservation, I intend to continue to use it as part of our conservative toolbox. But don't panic if you get that notice? Please do not panic. It is something that is used across the country, across the world. In June, when we issued our notice for conservation, at the same time where there were conservation alerts on the West Coast, there were conservation alerts or requests on the East Coast, and there was a conservation alert in Chicago. So the exact same time we issued it, there were alerts throughout the country for the very same reason, in order to help the grid manager to keep the grid reliable. And when you say don't panic, it's the opposite. Conservation for electricity is about the little things. For a few hours at, at a time, uh, it's a simple thermostat change. It's waiting to run your dishwasher and your washing machine overnight instead of when you get home from work at, at 5 o'clock. Uh, it's closing your shades and blinds. It's the little things for a few hours, maybe a few days at a time. And very much, very much like Texas treats water conservation. Uh, cities and water providers across the state have uh, summer restrictions on lawn watering or washing your car. It's, it's not much different than that. It's you understand the reaction that people had when we got that conservation of us just on the heels of a major crisis. Absolutely. And that's... That's on us to communicate that better and communicate what that really means. And that's part of why we're here today, to make sure people understand that it, it, it's the opposite of panic. It's just it's a few things for a few hours here and there. It's, it's, not, it's no different than uh, changing your lawn watering schedule when it gets to be a hot summer. Anybody coming across here? Jeremy, over here. Chairman, um, at a recent... Senate committee hearing, you said the market needs to move away from a, quote, crisis-based business model, that there's only a, a financial reward to uh, the closer you get to crisis. Can you explain that a little bit more? A crisis-based business model doesn't sound too comforting when you're in the business of reliability. Uh, it's, it's not, and that's why we've got to get away from it. Uh, when, I say in the, when I say a crisis-based business model, the part of the payment structures in the ERCOT market design, uh, has, there's an element that's essentially a bonus. And that bonus is only paid in a meaningful way when the reserves on the grid get closer and closer to zero. And so at, through no fault of their own, the generators can only, uh, private companies can only generate revenue as Texas gets closer and closer to the edge. And that's, as you said, that is not a good way to run a reliable grid. And so that's why we're redesigning the entire thing from scratch. And then, well, that segues into my follow-up. I know you don't have the particulars yet, and obviously the sausage-making process needs to happen, but just for perspective, how do you accomplish that? Do you foresee tweaking here and there or fine-tuning, or does the market need a major overhaul? The market needs and will receive a major overhaul. We're, we absolutely must move away from the crisis-based business model. And we want, as I said, we want to get 
the economic reward. If, you, if these private companies are generating power in Texas, we want them to be paid for generating reliably and consistently without the grid having to get to crisis mode. So what form that takes and the mechanics and, and what that looks like under the hood, we don't know yet. And there's a lot of implications there that impact stakeholders, customers, and uh, the, the companies that generate power. We need more companies coming to Texas to generate power. Right now, we don't have any. Your timeline on all of this? Uh, the market redesign will, the, the structure of it will be established by the end of the year, if not sooner. Depending on which mechanism and gears need to be turned, the implementation could take longer, uh, but also wouldn't rule out a, a phased implementation. And Mr. Jones, if I may, um, in your 60-point roadmap that you mentioned, one of the one of the points concerns transmission congestion, uh, particularly in the Valley. The Valley export, as mm -hmm. I understand it, is rated to carry about 6,000 megawatts, but at times that line is constrained down to 650 or so. Um, why does ERCOT limit the amount of power that can flow on these lines so much? So in answer to your question, it is fairly complex, but I'll keep it very simple. Uh, we have to manage all of the transmission lines to make sure that we're not overloading any line. So in the valley, what we have is a situation where there is local generation that helps support the need to serve load. But if that local generation is not available, if it has an outage for some reason, we may have to constrain the power flows across those lines sim simply similar to if you hook too many Christmas lights together, you're going to have a problem. You'll blow a fuse eventually. So we have to make sure that we're not overloading those lines. And in a situation, as I said, where we have generation out, possibly it could be for a drought condition in the area. They aren't able to produce what we would like them to produce. We become, uh, we end up in a less than reliable situation. So my focus has been, and this has really existed for 15 years because the valley has grown so fast over that time. We continue to be behind the curve on building transmission in that area. So my team and I have been talking with the leadership of the commission. We've also been talking with the leadership of each of the transmission providers in that area to develop a plan for improving reliability both into and out of the valley. A lot more generation coming on, particularly renewals. And so I, I love that you use generic transmission constraint. I didn't expect to hear that today. Uh, but yes, you're exactly so right. My question is, as more wind, as more solar gets built and is built rather quickly, can ERCOT keep up, can it play catch up, or is congestion going to get worse before it gets better? So that's our goal, is to stay ahead of it. Our goal is to identify where things are moving and to stay ahead of it. So we have to make sure that for the valley, for example, if we're relying upon wind or solar generation in another part of the state to serve that load, we have to make sure that that wind or, or solar generation will be available to us at the time that we need it. So there's a lot of studies going on. It's not just the valley. I've got a keen focus on the valley because I believe we have underserved that area for the last 15 years. But there are other areas, and I would include Corpus Christi as an example. Corpus Christi relies on a significant amount of local generation the transmission is limited into the city, and so occasionally we can get into a bind if that generation is not available. And real quickly, the math on the calendar always doesn't work out. You can build a wind project in a year, year and a half, transmission line may take four, five, six. And so on one hand, you're saying you're behind the curve, but the goal is to stay ahead. Those two comments don't match. So, so, so you hit on exactly what we want to do. We want to look at our transmission planning process to see if we can push at the edges of that planning process so that we can create more opportunities to recognize that m we may not see 3,000 megawatts that are planning to interconnect in the next three years, but we may be able to project that we expect 6,000 in the next 10. And so if we can begin to push at the edges of that transmission planning process, I believe we'll do a much better job of staying ahead. And, and part of improving that transmission planning process is focusing on dispatchable. So if you've got a universe of, of wind farms and solar arrays, but some of them have battery backup, thus enhancing their dispatchability, we need to move them to the front of the list. And so that's, that's part of the process. It's not finalized yet, but like I said, this redesign focuses on reliability and 
moving the transmission queue is part of that. Um, one of the governor's items for you guys was to have um, renewables compensate for their lack of generation through billing process, I think. Is there some, is there clarity on how that will uh, come to fruition functionally, or is that still a work in progress? That's a work in progress. That's the under the hood mechanics that we're working through okay. uh, to drive to those ultimate goals of reliability and accountability. And that's why also why we're having these series of work sessions that are open commission meetings. Uh, we had the first one on market redesign uh, in early July where we're bringing a whole array of stakeholders, renewables, dispatchables, it, the whole array uh, into this room so that everybody can be in front of the commission, have ERCOT participating, and work through these details. One more. Um, since 2015, and up to 2023, the planned projects that are going to be added. There's a, there's a lot of solar and wind being added, uh, but we've also seen a drop in uh, natural gas and coal. Is there plans to incentivize rebuilding, whether it's natural gas, coal plants, um, down the road, or is that kind of just the way it's going to be? Well, that's, that's part of the market redesign towards reliability and accountability. And like I said, we're not in the business of picking winners and losers. We want to incentivize the result that Texas needs, reliable electricity on an accountable basis. And if that takes the form of a gas plant with backup fuel storage and redundant supply, that's more reliable. If that's a solar array with ba batteries uh, attached to it, that's reliable and dispatchable. So we're driving for the result. Okay. Anybody else in the room? Yeah, Wes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, mentioned that there are 30 rulemaking processes underway, and that sounds like a lot, but, but I guess I'm wondering, did the legislature, did Texas do enough uh, to uh, update the grid, and is there anything else that the legislature can or should do at this point? 30 is not enough? <laughs> <laughs> the, the legislature did a tremendous job in the most substantial energy reform in almost a quarter century. They addressed, they deliberated and addressed a wide range of topics, considered a, var a variety of options, and at the end of the day delivered exactly what we, the Commission, needs to implement the changes to get Texas the result the state needs. And this question is for both of you. Um, you know, more than 200 people died as a result of, of this uh, February storm, at least. Um, so, I guess, respectfully, why should the public trust or believe that all of these updates uh, will make the system better. Why, why should they have faith in, in, in both of these agencies and in this process? Because we've completely reorganized the way ERCOT is run the, in the existing market framework. As Brad mentioned, the uh, procurement of reserves and the ERCOT authority to force generators on are tools that have been underutilized and I, I think it's fair to say that that operation at ERCOT has been turned 180 degrees around. Uh, like Jeremy said, when the previous crisis-based business model meant that the market demanded fewer, fewer reserves called later in time because that was what the market design demanded. We've completely turned that model on its head and started calling more reserves sooner. So that is an absolute, absolute 180 degree shift from the way we've done business before. So that will make the, then that's happening now. That makes the grid more reliable for this summer. And in the meantime, we're working on redesigning the market structure so we don't run into those market incentive problems in the future. Good, thank you. One more in the room. Um, so one Our implementing the weatherization mm -hmm. legislation is in process now. Uh, it will be take the form of roughly two phases. The first phase is working with generators to account for the specific problems they had last winter and making sure those 
problems are fixed for the upcoming winter. The second phase will be a broader policy implementation that sets several levels of standards for weatherization resiliency that will be implemented more broadly over time. I would also note that uh, this summer ERCOT has initiated more site inspections than they have in the past. Perhaps you could speak to that. Sure. So in the past, we did not do summer weatherization checks. We began doing that this year. We uh, checked over 31 units uh, to make sure they were ready for the summer season. In addition, we're getting prepared to do uh, checks on all of the units that had problems during the winter storm. So we'll go back. Our intent is to cover all of those units as well as a few others to do those weatherization checks in advance of the winter. So we do have one question that came in from Brendan Gibbons with San Antonio Report, and he asked, uh, wanted to ask uh, Brad, could you give an update on why an unusually large number of generators tripped offline in early June? Good. So I, I've tried to answer this question before because we don't know exactly why uh, the large group of generators did trip off in June. We do know reasons for each of the generators. Uh, they have reported that to us. We've also issued an RFI to them. About 60 percent of the responses have come in. We're waiting for the other responses. I think they're coming in by the 23rd, which should be this coming Friday. Uh, at that time, we'll do an analysis of those reasons. But let me, without Waiting for that analysis, let me tell you that there are a number of potential reasons why these generators have been out. I've said it before. Uh, possibly it could be that some of them were affected by the very cold weather in February and that those units are just now experiencing these failures, these mechanical failures because of the winter weather. Part of the reason could be that we have less time available today for these generators to take outages and to do regular repairs. It used to be that during the summer and winter they were needed by ERCOT and all Texans to operate and that the winter and the, and the fall and the spring weather there was time for them to take maintenance. Today because of the wind generation is really at its maximum in the spring and the fall we need more dispatchable generation in the spring and the fall so that leaves less time for these generators to do regular maintenance. Number three and I believe this is a part of it, is that we currently in our market aren't providing the adequate level of revenues for many generators to do the maintenance that they should be doing. So there are many older units in the system that, that perhaps aren't getting the maintenance dollars because our market has been so efficient that it's difficult for some of those generators to allocate the funds to keep those units operating. Those are the three options that I've seen so far. We'll be looking into that as we get this information. We'll get back to each of you. So now I'd like to go ahead and go to our uh, media joining us by phone. So Don, if you could go ahead and bring in the first caller. Certainly. First, we're going to the line of Lori Brown from Fox 4 Dallas. Please go ahead. Yes, um, I heard you say in response to a question earlier that the increased reliability is not going to cost consumers more. That sounds a little too good to be true. A lot of experts have said more money needs to be invested in the grid to make it more reliable. So how will ERCOT increase reliability with no additional cost to consumers? Sorry, I want to clarify that. I said the, uh, when asked about the future market redesign, we're, we don't anticipate redesigning the market to increased cost. We want to reallocate the economics as they exist now to more move the revenues companies receive to generators that are more dispatchable. As for the increased reliability this summer, those certainly come with uh, increased costs. Uh, all in, the dollars spent so far uh, this summer for the dramatic increases in both reserves and generators forced into service, uh, total less than $2 per person across uh, all participants, members of the, or citizens within ERCOT. Okay, and with the record heat expected next week, what are the chances of a need to go to rolling blackouts? As I said, currently we expect to have enough generation to serve the needs of all Texans next week. Okay, thank you. Don, next question, please. Thank you, and next, 
we're going to the line of James Downing, Power Markets Today. Yeah, um, my question is, is, is the capacity market on the table at all? That was not addressed in legislation uh, that came out of the 80th, 87th legislature, so that is not contemplated at this time. And I have another one, too. Um, uh, Alison Silverstein has written about how there's a lot of, um, a lot, but one of the issues this, this winter and generally is that a lot of the uh, housing in, in Texas has really poor insulation and that has led to a lot of inefficiencies. Is there, is there, do you see any effort for improving that, that situation at all for, you know, maybe funding some uh, retrofits to make, make housing more, more efficient? I think that's outside the scope of the legislation that was passed this session and would uh, be a broader policy topic uh, that a future legislation legislature would probably take up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Don. Next question. Thank you. And once again, if you have a question, please press 1-0. Next, we're going to the line of Mitchell Farman, the Texas Tribune. Please go ahead. Hey, Chairman Lake, uh, how do you get more companies to invest in power generation when you said you don't know what the market redesign will look like? Well, we're, we're engaging with those stakeholders to find out what they need so we can redesign the market to provide them exactly those incentives. We, we don't have a hard or fast number or and don't know the structure yet, but that's why we're running such a, a wide-reaching and transparent process to make sure our new market design encompasses the economics those companies need. Uh, we, we need to make sure that they, that their next investment dollar will be spent in more dispatchable and re reliable power in Texas. And one more question. What are the challenges in communicating with a public that doesn't trust you? Uh, the challenges are extensive. Uh, we've got to re regain their trust and we've got to earn it. We're working hard to do that through more extensive communication, uh, more clarity in our communication to make sure that the message that we're sending translates clearly from a very complex grid management operation to language that everyday folks will understand. Um, then that's, that's no small task. We, but we're, we're dedicated to that mission and we're well on our way, I think, to making that happen. Mm -hmm. Do you have examples of how you plan to do that? I'd say this press conference today is an example of that. Uh, Brad's uh, roadmap to reliability is another example. Uh, we're both of which are, as far as I know, unprecedented in recent history of the Public Utility Commission and ERCOT. Good. Thank you, Mitchell. Don, next question, please. Next, we're going to the line of Andrew Moore, KCN TV. <laughs> Good morning, guys. I have uh, two questions here real quick. Uh, the first one was that, you know, we, we've learned that currently some thermal power generators only bid into the electricity market uh, one day at a time. And so that bid depends on current prices. And so you had previously asked ERCOT why they don't schedule thermal generation several days out. It, it looks like they can't because there are these power generators only scheduling one day at a time. So would it be possible to change this so that some power generators bid three days at a time, but maybe they would get a capacity payment to cover certain costs over those three days so they don't risk losing money? I, we're evaluating any and all options within the scope of the legislation we were given. Uh, there's a variety, as I mentioned, there's a variety of mechanisms that we can use to incentivize uh, reliability and accountability. Good. I really have nothing to add to that, Chairman. Uh, I would just say that that, that that is well down into the details of the type of market design changes we have to look at. And so the Chairman and I are meeting on a weekly basis in person. We're also talking with each other several times uh, a day, in fact. And we will be providing options to the to the Commission on the types of market design changes that may be necessary. And the, the PUC will then provide us that policy guidance. 
Okay. And secondly, this is for, for ERCOT. With our current uh, available power generators, so, we, so we're going into a really hot week next week, uh, could you commit right now, if you wanted to, having 80,000 megawatts uh, an hour of power available during the hottest weeks of summer, including next week, to stay ahead of those projections? Could we say right now, yeah, we're going to pull the right levers, we're going to have 80,000 megawatts an hour available all of next week to make sure that we are covered? Uh, so I think you're under the I think you're confused that we need to do that early. By doing that early, we spend fuel in our generators that we don't need to spend. It becomes a problem for the market. We want to make sure that we're taking the right actions at the right time. And so, for example, if a generating unit takes eight hours to start, we will begin to call upon that unit probably nine hours in advance. But we won't call on that unit 24 or 36 hours in advance because that would be a waste of resources. So I understand your question, but uh, the reason why we are dispatching those units closer to the time is we're watching the amount of time it takes for them to come up and online, and we are making sure that we match that so that we don't waste additional fuel resources. Well, okay, when, when, then when you need it, are you confident you could get 80,000 megawatts when you need it next week? Yes, we are confident. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Don, next question. Thank you. And next, we go into the line of David Baker, Bloomberg News. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks. Uh, just sort of a nuts and bolts question to follow up on that last one. You had mentioned uh, earlier in the press conference that uh, you're going to have 56% more power reserves for August than last year. Could you, could you just put that in terms of megawattage uh, for comparison? Uh, so I'll give you some numbers to work off of. Uh, so in the past, we have operated with roughly about 5,000 megawatts across the peak. This is 5,000 megawatts that are, are not committed to serving energy in the market. So there are 5,000 of additional reserve megawatts. It's so where we operate in the past. We began operating in uh, early June with 6,500 megawatts across peak. In addition to setting that minimum amount of generation that we will will operate to, we have also purchased an additional 1,500 megawatts of ancillary services in the form of what we call non-spin, and we are purchasing 500 megawatts of additional ancillary services in a separate category called responsive reserves. So all total, we're bringing 2,000 megawatts on in our ancillary service. Uh, categories as well as making sure that we have 6,500 across those peak times. One last thing I would say is that we are also making sure now that we can release, release those ancillary services to the market quicker. In the past, we had to, by rule, we had to hold on to those longer. Now we'll be releasing those to the market quicker to maintain reliability. And I'll also make an important note that previously, Ancillary service, the amount of ancillary services set to be procured on a certain date was set a year in advance. Mm -hmm. And when we say we're doing business differently, that process has been changed so that now ancillary services are being, the amount of reserves being procured is set not only based on the historic anticipated need, but also on real time conditions. Good. Thank you, Chairman. One of the changes that we've made is when we see uncertain weather conditions in the grid. And let me give you an example. Uh, a few Mondays ago, we expected a weather front to come through Dallas. That weather front was expected to rain about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So our model showed that Dallas load was dropping by roughly about 2,000 megawatts because of the rain. And behind the front, we had wind picking up by another two to 3,000 megawatts. So a 5,000 megawatt delta in our forecast, if we had failed, and in fact, we were exactly right on our forecast, but if we had failed and even by two hours had missed when that front came through Dallas, that front would have still been to the west of Dallas. It would have been hot in Dallas, so higher load in the Dallas area. The wind would have been less out west because the front had not cleared the western part of our state that 5,000 megawatt difference could have had a significant impact on us. So when we see uncertain weather conditions that can change our forecast dramatically, as I've expressed to you, we will be buying 
even more ancillary services than what we're currently doing. So we'll go to the market, we'll pull, pull in up to 1,500 megawatts of additional ancillary services. Uh, the bottom line is we're doing business differently. Margin of safety and abundance of caution, and for the first time ever, ERCOT is taking into account real-time conditions in establishing the amount of reserves we need going into each and every day. Okay. Don, next question, please. Thank you. And next, we're going to the line of Adela Yutita from CBS Austin. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, my question to you, uh, sorry, I'm outside. Um, <laughs> You talked earlier during the press conference about weatherization. I want to know when weatherization will be complete, if everyday Texans next winter would be able to say, I can depend on my grid. Um, and what about the natural gas plants that lost power during the February blackout? As for weatherization, the first phase that I referenced earlier will be completed by this winter. The second phase will be implemented starting this fall and going throughout the next 12 months. As for natural gas, I'd have to refer to you to, I mean, we're work, the efforts we're working with the Railroad Commission on to map critical infrastructure and natural gas, but as for uh, the broader natural gas conversation, I'd have to refer you to the Railroad Commission. Right, correct, but I'm asking not necessarily about the plants themselves, but them being designated as critical infrastructure. I understand some of them lost power during the blackout because they weren't designated as such. Uh, that's correct. That, at the transmission and distribution level, that critical infrastructure designation is being corrected as we speak. Yes, sir. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, first of all, the PUC is starting, I believe, today, perhaps. No, I, I think it's next week, the 26th. The, uh, the PUC is starting a poles and wires discussion. In that discussion uh, will be part of this discussion associated with critical infrastructure, making, making sure that that is signed up as critical for each of the wireless companies. In addition to that effort, though, uh, there were some loads that were participating. I mean, by loads, I mean, for example, there were some uh, uh, gas facilities that were participating in our uh, emergency responsive service, which means that they had participated and they received payments for their willingness to shut off. We found out later that some of those loads were actually critical for gas supply. And so now, just on this last Monday, we have uh, offered up a rule change to the market that will require every load participating in both our ERS, which is emergency responsive service, and our load responsive service, both categories, we will require that load to attest to us that they are not a critical service load. Okay, thank you, Don. Next question, please. Thank you, and next we're going to the line of Vince Sims, NBC5, Dallas-Fort Worth. Yes, good morning. I think earlier you did talk about the summer spot checks that you were doing in regards to that and gave some information. If you could again say for us what these summer spot checks were looking at, how many of these you did, and what was found through this? Were there any issues or any of the plants down through this? So throughout the 30, more than 31 units that we inspected, we reviewed their plans for summer preparedness, and we also were able to translate best practices that we have learned from other facilities. So we were able to communicate with them to review that they'd met their own emergency operation plans as well as improve those plans overall. Good. Don, can you give us the next question, please? And also, Don, can you tell us how many more callers are in queue? That was the final question in queue. No. Oh, wonderful. Well, that, uh, that concludes our broadcast day. So I want to thank everybody for being here, and I want to thank, thank you both for the time, and uh, have a lovely day. This concludes our conversation. Hey there, everybody, and thanks for sticking with us. I'm Will Dupree in the KXAN Live studio here in Austin. That was a news conference that has just concluded between uh, the chairman of the Public Utility Commission of Texas and the interim president and CEO of ERCOT, the Electric Liability Council of Texas. Uh, they were talking about what is being done so that uh, we do not run into any power issues this particular summer. Uh, we should really highlight what is expected next week. So the ex the 
expectation is that temperatures are going to climb through this weekend and into next week, and ERCOT is anticipating record uh, demand for electricity. Uh, their uh, assurance to us and then their vote of confidence is that there will be enough power to meet that demand next week. They also went into great detail about some of the other reforms and changes that are being put into place in this market redesign effort that is going to take quite some time as they reiterated over and over and over again today. Uh, so we will keep reporting about this. You can trust us to stay on top of it and keep asking questions. Uh, for more coverage about what was discussed today, go over to our website. That's KXAN.com. And you can also check out the KXAN News app available on your smartphone to download right now. Thank you all again for watching. I'm Will Dupree. We'll see you back here throughout the day with additional updates. Please, everybody, stay safe, be healthy, and take care.